So yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I'm an educator. Personally, I welcome the initiative of Mandy Mock uh, from the uh, uh, I forgot the name of the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from Singapore to, to kind of establish this kind of system and involving private higher education institutions in Thailand. I think this is, this is a kind of uh, a choice for our members of the AFIT or Association of Private Higher Education Institutions of Thailand. Um, the topic of the discussion today is on the impact of higher education ranking systems on universities. Let me uh, briefly talk about the quality assurance system in Thailand so that it will be a background for your company to understand how we operate private higher education uh, in, in Thailand. Uh, firstly, uh, the private higher education institutions, if you, they want to establish or to set up a new higher education institution, they have got to go by the, the, uh, the Private Higher Education Institution Act. We have an act that we have got to follow. And in the act, it describes the things, a kind of quality control from the beginning before you set up the institution. And those components must comply with the uh, description of the Ministry of Higher Education Science um, uh, Research and, and, and Innovation. I think that is, that is a requirement. Uh, uh, secondly, in by law, there is a system of internal quality assurance and external quality assurance system. And this is not a choice, not by choice, it is a must. Every higher education system, including the private higher education uh, institutions, you must have, uh, you have got to set the quality, internal quality assurance system in the management of, uh, of the institution. This is a requirement. And the, each institution have got to, um, to, to kind of uh, assess themselves every year. They must, from this, the quality assurance system, they have got to assess themselves every year and prepare the self-assessment report uh, for checking their progress or their improvement and any further improvement that needed. And this information must be submitted to the Higher Education Council or the Ministry of Higher Education, Science and uh, Research and Innovation. This is a requirement by law. So the information will be, I mean, is there at the ministry. Anything you would like to know about the individual institution, the profile, that must be requested from the ministry. Uh, or you can contact the individual uh, institution. The, the uh, association is not uh, in control of that. We, we cannot share any information about uh, the self-assessment with any organization outside. It must be the uh, consent of each institution. But anyhow, every institution, private higher education institution, including the public ones, have got to uh, submit the self-assessment report every year to the ministry. Uh, secondly, every five years, we have the external assessment as well. So we have internal quality assurance system and external quality assurance system as well. Every five years will be assessed. It, this is a must, not by choice. Some countries uh, leave it to the institution that whether they would like the institution to be assessed externally by the agent outside. That is by, by choice. But they must have the internal quality assurance system. But in Thailand, every five years, by law, each institution must 
have this kind of activity and also submitted the result of the assessment to the ministry. So the database belongs to the, the Ministry of Higher Education. Now, since the beginning of this year, not, not the beginning, at maybe a few months ago, there is a new measure uh, that the each institution, higher education institution can choose the agent according to their kind of interest, whether it fits their purpose or not. So when you talk about ranking system of higher education or universities, it depends, it is by choice. If the indicators of the, um, the ranking system that, that, that you develop fit the purpose of the university, in that case, they may, uh, uh, the, uh, your, your organization might be one choice because the ministry allows you, allow the institution to choose the agents that is recognized by the ministry. So you must, you must kind of to, 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 to submit for approval or accept it by the ministry, whether it, is, it meet the standards or not. That is the, uh, the process that we did or the practice we, we, we do every year. But every five years, there is an external assessment. Every year we have the internal quality assurance assessment and each institution have got to do the self-assessment report. We call it SAR. So um, we have started the internal and external quality assurance systems, which are prescribed by the law 20 years ago, 20 years ago. We have been, I mean, we, the university is getting used to this kind of practice. If we want to step forward about the ranking system globally or internationally, they must, I believe from my practice, that they have got to be sure that they have been through the internal and external quality assurance until they have uh, prepared the data needed and they can choose from the available external assessor, I mean, or, or the, 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 uh, the agents outside, whatever system it is, they will check the uh, indicators, whether it fits the purpose of the university or not. Uh, I think this depends, it depends because some organization or agent might be well recognized, but that indicator do not fit the purpose of the individual institution, then they might, they, might, they might not choose that kind of agent. So the choice is up to the, the individual institution. But if the um, applied higher education has set the indicator or develop or created the indicators that fit the functions of private universities. Then the indicators that need the data, the data, the set of data that they have, might, it will be easier for them to choose your sets of, of indicators, you see? So that, that depends, that depends. If the set of indicators that you created are quite, you know, very different, far from what they actually performing that might not be their choice. Because when, when you change the kind of indicators, you need to change many things, you know, internally in, in the institution. It is not changing uh, or readily. It is not that easy. You got to prepare for years, for years uh, to try to be, you know, in the league table. So I would like to, to, to kind of to share with you, uh, Mandy, that private higher education in Thailand is under the Private Higher Education Institution Act. So we have by law. And in the Education Act of Thailand, it prescribes that each institution must 
have the internal quality assurance system embedded in the, in the university management system. And every year they have got to assess themselves. And the, the self-assessment report must be submitted to the ministry. This is automatically you know, done by each institution because they know what they have got to do each year. If not, then there might be a problem for the institution if they don't submit uh, the, the kind of uh, the self-assessment report uh, to the ministry. Other things, I mean, I mean, uh, apart from the internal, external quality assurance systems, these have been in practice in Thailand for more than 20 years. The external, the internal quality assurance system is uh, overseen by the Ministry of Higher Education, while the external quality assurance system and assessment is, well, in the past, we have another uh, public organi uh, organization to, to oversee this. But right now, uh, that organization is one choice. The ministry opens for each individual institution to, to choose the a kind of accredited, well-recognized agent to be the assessor of the institutions. D so Dr. You, Manit, yes. I, I, I'm really sorry that number one, I couldn't share your speech. And now I need to tell you that you've run out of time. <laughs> oh, I do, so uh, that's why, that's but, why I'd like to share the screen. That's, that's fine. That's, how, that's just, just I want to. The message to... is loud and clear and it's very interesting, the role of the external <laughs> okay, assessor okay, in Thai private for, university. Thank you, thank for, you very uh, much. for keeping your time. But also I hope that um, the, uh, you are, you are kind of, uh, I mean, your initiative, you know, is, is real. I mean, in my, for myself as an educator, I appreciate that. And I, I wish your organization is well received by our members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now the floor is for Mr. Pumperm Sak Aruni um, from the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, dear Manny Mock, founder and CEO of, of the Aptai Singapore, Dr. Panchai Mongkonwanit, Siam University, and Dr. Manit Bunpraser, Thai Way Higher Education Institution and Association, distinguished speaker and participant, lady and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to be with all of you at the Aptai HE Thailand Exchange, the new kid on the block, under the theme of the Impact Higher Education Ranking system on university today. On behalf of the Minister of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation Thailand, I would like to take this opportunity to thank our host, FIHE and Siam University for their contribution and dedication. The conference is not only the platform to review the importance of the university ranking in different perspectives, but also to share knowledge and best practice on higher education development. In many countries, including Thailand, higher education has played a major role in social and economic development. University, both public and private, have to improve themselves to serve the demand of students and employers, not only within the country or overseas. To accomplish this plan, university tend to be more innovative and globalized. Responding to the changing world, university ranking system seem to be one of the effective tools that can measure university government by using different criteria and the classification. For the proof, however, there might be some challenge that university have to prepare and understand. The Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation Thailand had a number of projects to lift up university capacity. One of them we call Reinventing University, which classify university into five main strategic groups for both the public and private university in order to strengthen their performance and potential align with the government focus. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to end my remark by welcoming all of you to the conference. My thanks goes to Aptai HE, Siam University, and our partner. I wish the conference have really success. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, now allow me to give the floor to uh, Miss Mandy Mock, the founder and CEO of Applying HE. Go ahead, Mandy. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Applied HE launch exchange for Thailand. It's great to be back again, albeit virtually, no and problem. to see so it's many nice. old friends. We have been very active organizing launch events like this for countries around the world from Pakistan, Kazakhstan, Indonesia, to the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, Taiwan, the Philippines, Vietnam, and recently Malaysia, with Russia, Nepal, Sri Lanka, South Africa, Korea, Japan, and China in the pipeline. The Applied AG Exchange is an opportunity for us to give you a flavor of what Applied AG has to offer and in exchange to better understand the issues that you are facing in Thailand. I'm very grateful to our host, Siam University, especially Dr. Ponchai Mongkonvanit, president of Siam University and his awesome team. Thank you all for your great support. Appreciation also to the keynote speaker, Dr. Kevin Downing, Secretary to Council and Court, Director of Institutional Research Office, City University of Hong Kong. And I'd also like to acknowledge Dr. Manit Boon Prasad, Director of the Association of Private Higher Education Institutions of Thailand, Afit, and Mr. Pum, Pan Perm Sak Aruni, Senior HRD Specialist from the Office of the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation Thailand for gracing the event. And to our group of panelists, Professor Dr. Vichyan Prem Chaiswadi, Vice President of Siam University, Vice President of Digital Council of Thailand and IT Committee Chair of AFID Thailand. Associate Professor Dr. Malani Sri Ari Yanun, who is the Assistant to the President for University Internationalization Strategies and Special Affairs, King Mongkut University of Technology, North Bangkok, Thailand. Professor Ilan Mohan, who is the president of the National Association of Private Educational Institutions, NAPE, in Malaysia. Dr. Kevin Downing, who will be joining the panelists as well. And to our moderator, Assistant Professor Dr. Yuthana Srisavat, who is the Deputy Dean from the Faculty of Law, Siam University. And finally, thanks to you, the audience from across Thailand and beyond. Thank you for joining us today. I created and launched Applied HE in January of 2020, almost after an almost 20 year career at QS with the aim of creating an alternative solution in ranking, rating and branding that better serves the need of more learning and employability focused applied universities, which I believe are dominant in the ASEAN region, in fact, all over the world. At the same time, the solutions Applied HE offers are compatible with other rankings out there. It's not an either or choice. Applied HE can help you with international branding and marketing, student recruitment, benchmarking, and a range of other solutions. Because Applied HE is the new kid on the block, we are nimbler, hungrier, and more sensitive to your needs and ready with a whole suite of exciting and innovative services. At the same time, my team, who are also veterans from QS and I are highly experienced in this sector. So we have an unparalleled track record that speaks for itself. So without further ado, let's get started. We have produced Applied HE as a fresh, modern and totally relevant concept in benchmarking and branding of higher education institutions offering solutions that's focused on employability and learning. As mentioned, Applied HE was launched on the 1st of January of 2020. So we're still very young, just a year and a half old. And now you have an alternative choice from what is currently available in the market. A globally oriented higher education, evaluation and branding company that is rooted in Asia and which aims to positively disrupt the global higher education sector. You'll find that our tagline for the company aptly amplifies that, skills and job ready, future proof. Our strength lies in reaching out, not only to academics, but also include stakeholders from industry, civil society, government, students, parents, alumni, faculty, basically everybody. I will introduce the company Applied HE and all our initiatives from evaluation tools, that's the set of ratings, 
to building your global reputation and networking solutions. And of course, our special events and special projects. All these creative strategies will help your institution achieve not only global, but also local visibility and branding with all your stakeholders quickly and cost effectively. Applied AG is the new brand for all skills-based employment focused education. And our mission is designed to help universities to communicate with your stakeholders, engage with your international and local peers, industry and government, brand your institution worldwide, including improving in the rankings. And our vision is to be the dominant brand that empowers employability and lifelong learning. So I've grouped the initiatives into four segments. Let's start with the evaluation tools. When we first started the company in January, 2020, we only had one product and that is the job ready rating. Today, I'm pleased to say Applied AG has three rating systems. We have the all round job ready rating system to evaluate the quality of teaching and learning and employability of your graduates. An English ready rating to evaluate the quality of English language as a medium of instruction in non-English speaking countries. And it is a great marketing tool for the recruitment of international students as well. And the online ready rating, which helps your institution benchmark and promote its online programs and courses. This set of ratings not only serve as benchmarking tools, but they're also effective and affordable marketing tools for your institution. They can benchmark your institution's performance for quality improvement as our criteria are relevant and implementation is relatively quick. And it is not just a rating per se, it also provides market intelligence so that you can make informed decisions and strategies without having to go for expensive market consultancies. As a marketing tool, it can quickly communicate to your stakeholders, your institution's excellence and quality. The fact that you are affiliated with the Applied AG brand also shows that you are job and skills ready, future proof. Basically, the ratings is a great tool to meet your institution's quest for global branding and excellence. So the Applied AG job ready rating is so versatile that it can be applied to not only universities, but also suitable for professional institutions. By professional, we mean the vocational, the TBETs, polytechnics and colleges. It's also suitable for business schools and online education. The job ready rating is aimed at evaluating professional education, such as engineering, nursing, medicine, law, accounting, art and design, media, basically any program that involves industry collaboration. And we do it differently. Here's the new perspective, the creative twist. We do not do a rating of your institution per se. We rate your institution based on your programs by employment cluster. This means we can now bring the global spotlight to your every program, regardless of whether it's big or small. And currently there is no marketing tool in the market to help you achieve this. Take for example, the employment cluster healthcare. The mainstream subjects that fall under healthcare are your medicine, dentistry, and nursing. But what about the smaller ones like radiology, physiotherapy, and even hospital administration? Now with the Applied HE Job Ready Ratings methodology, we can bring the global spotlight to your every program, whether it's big or small. This is the employment cluster adapted from the International Standard Industrial Classification. There are 22 of them, and it covers all sectors of the economy. And this list is growing daily because the world is changing so fast that there are many jobs out there today that never existed in the past. Jobs like these, e-commerce, gaming, coding, social media marketing, influencer, blogger, just to name a few. And these are not even proper words in the past, but today they are reputable and very much sought after jobs. And our unique approach to rating by employment clusters can accommodate these new jobs and the future economy. You'll note that many of our criteria overlaps with the goals of the SDG. The Applied AG Job Ready Rating is done primarily by surveys to your stakeholders, stakeholders like your students, faculty, employers, and alumni. So what this means is you will have access to market intelligence of your key stakeholders. And these information are very relevant to your strategies, future plans, internal decision-making, KPIs, et cetera. And it is market intelligence that you do not have to pay a hefty sum for 
as it comes as part of the ratings. This is all part of our effort to help you stretch your budget as much as possible. Once rated, you will be presented with the Applied HE Job Ready Ratings Badge and you can use it on all your marketing materials. The ratings are awarded by Employment Cluster and the country of origin is clearly stated so that stakeholders are clear on the market that you serve. This is very important as employment and jobs differ in each country. The three levels that you can score, job ready, job ready with merit, and the highest is job ready with distinction. And the rating badges are valid for three years. You'll also receive a certificate listing the score and all the evaluated programs. So this means even your smallest program will be able to share the global limelight. The job ready ratings will help to associate your institution with quality of teaching and learning and employability of your graduates. Now let's look at the Applied HE English Ready Rating. It's a great tool to evaluate an institution's English medium of instruction readiness. As you know, many universities around the world now offer programs in English, but the level and completeness of English language instruction varies greatly especially for universities from non-English speaking countries, which offer English language degree programs. So to summarize, the Applied HE English Ready Rating is a useful internal benchmarking tool and a great marketing tool for the recruitment of international students. The rating enables you to rate the extent and quality of instruction in English, not just for individual programs, but also suitable for departments and or institutions. It's a great tool for international benchmarking of EMI and identifying strengths and weaknesses, and also an effective tool for the recruitment of international students. And of course, the surveys help you to better understand your stakeholders' perception of EMI. Once rated, you will receive a badge and a certificate, which you can use on all your marketing materials and let the world know that your programs are English ready. I'm pleased to say that we have completed the pilot with universities from Vietnam, Taiwan, and Indonesia. The third rating. In today's environment, online degrees are an increasingly appealing alternative to traditional on-campus programs. Online learning is here to stay, and even if things go back to normal, it won't be the normal that we know, but the new normal, which is why we need to be ahead of the curve now, as there is a huge demand for online courses. The future is going to be a hybrid mix of online and physical attendance, and the earlier we're ready for it, the better. The benefits of being online ready rated are many. First, it enables your institution to have a global benchmark and understand better how others' online programs are performing. It's also a great marketing and branding tool to attract not only domestic, but also international students, as it helps to demonstrate your institution's online ready learning to a global audience. And with this rating, you can understand your stakeholders' perceptions of the different aspects of online learning so that you can create relevant strategies to meet their needs. And once rated, you will receive a certificate and a badge to let your stakeholders know that your institution is online ready. Next, we come to the second group of initiatives, and that is our strategies for global reputation and networking. We recently launched Future in January. Future is the world's first professional networking platform created especially for the higher education sector. We have the physical and virtual events under the brand of Exchange, and we also have an e-news wire called Extra Extra, now indexed by Google News. Future was launched on the 20th of January this year. It is the world's first professional networking platform specially designed for the higher education sector. And Future aims to connect everyone from high school to professional career to lifelong learning for the three E's, education, employment, and everything in between. These are the most important career milestones in life from the moment you are a high school student to being a student in higher education, to being a successful graduate, employer, entrepreneur, or even an alumni donor. For ease of use, future is just like any other social media. The difference is Future provides all the relevant stuff that is important to the higher education sector, like news and information on universities, courses, scholarships, internships, research collaboration, student and faculty exchanges, resumes, jobs, industry news, 
lifelong learning, alumni engagement and management, and even networking at all stages of your life. In short, eventually, future will include the entire higher education and career experience from leaving high school to retirement. So think of future as the passport for life. It's free and it is the only professional networking platform you'll ever need. So please sign up for Future and encourage your friends and peers to sign up too. Recently, we launched a new feature in Future to help you with alumni engagement and management service. Institutions of higher learning in many parts of the world have long underestimated the value of their alumni network. And we all know that investing in alumni relations can provide a high return on investment for an institution. A strong alumni engagement strategy is not built overnight. Unfortunately, we can help your institution get started. As you can see from my slide here, there is a whole host of stuff that we can help you with your alumni engagement and management. And you can even design and customize your page on future to reflect your institution's branding, like the demo of NTU Singapore here. You can read all the text later as the slides will be provided to you after this webinar. I just want to draw your attention to the two points in bold and that is future is currently globally accessible and Facebook is not accessible in China. And the second point is this is a free service. So please do take advantage of it. If in doubt, do ask for a demo. We can connect easily with you via Zoom. And to give you a heads up, we're now in the process of building an alumni relationship management system to help you manage your alumni more, efficient, more efficiently. And this again is a complimentary service. There are many more innovative ideas in the pipeline for future. We aim to nurture the be all and end all of human capital, starting with high school, progressing through degree study, embracing professional career and lifelong learning. Another strategy for global branding is of course our physical events, but they need to be on hold now. To give you a quick introduction of our physical events, which also go by the brand exchange, you can host an exchange event by employment cluster or by subject, or you can host an exchange by region or even drill down to a specific country, example, exchange Thailand. Depending on your priorities, we can organize events to suit you. And these events are an effective strategy for global branding and networking. And by God's will, we hope to resume in 2022. But for now, since we can't travel because of COVID, we started a series of Squaring the Circle debate webinars since last year. It was fun, it was provocative, very refreshing. And I believe we were the most active in the online space with one webinar every month. Another regular webinar that is alternating with Squaring the Circle debate is the Fireside Chat. So for the rest of this year, we will have a webinar every first Wednesday of the month with Fireside Chat and Squaring the Circle debate alternating every other month all the way to December of 2021, always on a Wednesday evening, always at 8 p.m. Singapore time. So please keep your monthly first Wednesday nights free. The, the next webinar coming soon on the 6th of October is the Fireside Chat with the theme, What Does the Post-Pandemic New Normal Look Like in Higher Education? Hope to see all of you on the 6th of October. In addition to the regular monthly webinars, we also organize bespoke webinars according to client's topic of interest. So do check with us if you would like us to organize a webinar with your preferred theme. We will extend the marketing and handle all logistics for you. Check with us if you're interested. And we have our e-newsletter, Extra Extra, again, unique to Applied HE. Here, we can help you promote your institutional news on the global stage. And this is yet another complimentary service from us. All you have to do is send us your news that are extraordinary and we will publish and promote it across all our marketing platforms to your targeted global audience. In the short space of time since our launch, we're now indexed by Google News. So this means our readership is growing rapidly. Therefore, this is a great and targeted medium to showcase stories from your institution to the world at no charge at all. Our third group of initiatives, the special events and the bite-sized online internship is under our special events and we're currently running a pilot. This new initiative is the first of its kind and it involves three groups of important stakeholders. They are your students, your university and your employers. 
In short, for students, it will help them build a global network even before they graduate and connect with potential employers or industries before deciding on what they really want as a career. For universities, they will enhance the students' uni experience by exposing their students to an international online environment and connecting them to prospective international employers. And for the employers, they will have access to a diverse talent pool of top talent and original ideas. So you can see this new service is very innovative and creative and will definitely bring internships to a new level. Also under special events is the Applied HE Fireside Chat with students. This is a unique webinar format that connects students to international employers, hence allowing students to gain insight into the recruitment process and employer expectations while providing employers with an opportunity to connect with talented students. This event is promoted globally and it is a, high, it is a highly visible presentation of an institution's commitment to ensuring its students' international employability. Special projects is our fourth group of initiatives and their namely rankings. In addition to launching future, we also launched the Rankometer in January this year a new ranking that is based on one single and transparent benchmark. To be precise, the Rankometer is a composite ranking of the world's five most influential world university rankings. Please look out for Rankometer 2.0 in the first quarter of 2022 for some very interesting results. So with the launch of the Rankometer, we had good media coverage. And what this means is, it adds credibility to the new kid, that's us, Applied HE, as we've had many inquiries after. So this means if you're associated with the Applied HE brand, your branding and global visibility will be greatly enhanced too. And with the recent success and excitement from the launch of the Rankometer, plans to launch more important and relevant rankings are in the pipeline. We're currently looking at launching the Applied HE private university ranking by region and we're launching the private university ranking for ASEAN first with Middle East in the pipeline. So we will soon be reaching out to private universities across Malaysia, Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. Another very unique ranking to look out for are the national rankings. We have plans to produce a national ranking for both the private and public universities in each individual country. Discussions with many countries are already in motion. So what are the national rankings? They are a ranking of the private and public universities in your country. Over my almost two decades with my ex-company, we have heard so many complaints that the current rankings are not fair because they're putting such heavy emphasis on international reputation and research, etc. While they're important, these criteria are less relevant to your students and mission, where the key concern is your students getting a job. So how can your institution succeed when the rules don't fit? So supporting the Applied HE national rankings is your chance to rewrite the rules of the game in terms of university rankings. The national rankings will help to attract and nurture the nation's best talent, taking employability to the next level. So now you can take this opportunity to change the narrative, change the discussion, you can be the rule maker and not the rule taker. We are looking for a local supporting partner in each individual country. So please contact us if you're interested. This is my second last slide and I would like to leave you with a list of the first of its kind from Applied AG. We have Future, the world's first professional networking platform, specially created for the higher education sector, alumni engagement and management solutions, bite-sized online internships, and fireside chats for students. And for rankings, we have the Applied HE Rankometer for World University Rankings, and the Applied HE Private and Public University Rankings by Country for the National Rankings, and the Applied HE Private and Public University Rankings by Region, of which we will be launching the ASEAN Private University Ranking very soon. And this is my last slide, which gives you an overview of all the products and services that Applied HE have created in the short space of time since our inception. We are indeed the new kid on the block. And as mentioned in my opening, we are nimbler, hungrier, and more sensitive to your needs. Applied HE can help you 
with international branding and marketing, student recruitment, benchmarking, and a range of other solutions globally, that is local, global and local. So I hope you are as excited as we are creating all these new and innovative strategies for you. Please write to us if you have any questions or would like more information or even requests for demos. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mandy. And uh, now the floor is open to uh, Dr. Kevin Downing from the City University of Hong Kong, and I'm going to try and share his slides. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, thank you, uh, all the speakers so far. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name's um, Kevin Downing. Uh, I work in City University of Hong Kong, and um, I've written uh, several books on rankings as well as published more papers than I can remember on rankings. Um, in fact, I don't know whether it was a coincidence, but this year's book uh, is called, uh, you probably can't see that very well, The Impact of Higher Education Rankings on Universities. It was published in April. So if you want a bit more information on some of the stuff I'm presenting today, uh, go and uh, take a look at that. Okay. Um, I want to demonstrate why there is a need for a private university ranking system. I guess in many ways, I'm preaching to people that are already converted with lots of experience in the private university system. But I think it's useful for the panel discussion later to um, highlight some of the uh, key issues. So uh, I've undertaken a trend, a three-year trend of uh, Thai universities in the big three, that's QS Times Higher and ARWU, used to be called Shanghai uh, Jiao Tong. Um, and I'm going to run through that in a moment or two. Uh, but first of all, I just want to um, go through with you what I call the good, the bad and the ugly about rankings generally. OK, thanks, Peter. Um, here's some good things. What's good about rankings? Well, they do encourage thought about what indicates a good university. They also encourage benchmarking using a useful set of indicators. We may not agree with the, rank, with the weightings, but the indicators are generally accepted as being um, useful in some way. They can lead to improved management and governance within a university. They encourage healthy competition between universities, and I'll argue sometimes unhealthy competition later. They can encourage government investment, uh, even in private universities. Uh, and uh, they do pressure universities to be much more accountable than they were when I began my academic career. Some bad things. People attach, some people attach far too much importance to rankings. They neglect, they totally neglect the importance of private universities. They put private universities at a massive disadvantage. Actually, I think they also put some countries and their university systems at a massive disadvantage. I'll come back to that later. They can lead to a lack of investment in universities uh, with community or local visions rather than global. And I'm gonna put my hands up and say that Thailand is the country where I have seen the very best local community visioned universities that I've ever seen anywhere uh, in the world, uh, providing jobs for students and actually um, assisting communities to survive and develop in a very positive way. Uh, I've been to several of those universities. Um, unfortunately, rankings are often used as misleadingly as a measure of quality. Of course, they're not. Um, and ignorance of indicators can sometimes lead to misinterpretation by the consumers of the rankings, whether they be academics, their managers, uh, administrators, uh, people who lead universities, but also students and their families, prospective students and their families. Let's take a look at the next slide, Peter. Okay. I said good and bad. I've given you the good and the bad. Let's have some ugly. Um, successful careers and reputations of both senior and junior staff can be made or indeed broken over a few poor ranking indicators and sometimes over a misunderstanding uh, what those indicators are showing. 
They can lead to unfair pressure on some staff to cheat when submitting data to rankings agencies. And there have been several instances quite high profile over the last 10 years, particularly um, uh, in the big three rankings where universities have been excluded because they've been found to be um, cheating. But they can also lead to unfair accusations of cheating. Some universities get accused of cheating uh, and then exonerate themselves by having um, one of the big four audit companies come in and look at their ranking submission. They can make universities with local and community missions look poor when actually they're not. They just have a different mission from those universities that aspire to be WCUs or world-class universities, so-called. They ignore the crucial role played by private universities in educating our young people. And they encourage some to spend money with ranking agencies, believing it will lead to a rise in ranking. And I'm currently writing my fourth book on rankings, uh, where I have some fairly substantial, um, shall we say, not causal, but certainly correlational evidence to demonstrate there may be some truth in that final uh, comment. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, now let's take a look at the top 10 universities in Thailand over the past three years uh, in QSWUR, World Ranking, Asian Ranking, THWUR, and the um, Academic Ranking of World universities. You'll note that the top universities in these rankings are, are mostly the same universities and they're all public, funded by the government. I'm going to contrast that with the, the showing of the private universities in a moment. Okay, next slide. Okay, there are 10 universities ranked in the QSWUR, 17 in times higher, four in ARWU uh, from Thailand. Most ranks have relatively stable over the past three years. I'm going to skim through the slides themselves quite quickly. QS and THE have quite different results because, of course, they have some differences in their indicators. Uh, in QS, Thai universities have relatively high scores in academic and employer reputation, but perform poorly in citations and international students or faculty. In THE, Thai universities have good performance in citations and international outlook, but low scores in teaching and research. Let's move on. Let's have a look at some of the numbers and who these universities are. OK, these are the top universities in Thailand World University uh, uh, in QSWUR uh, and THE and ARWU. And you'll see they're what I would regard as those universities that I would expect to be um, largely in that top um, 10 or 11. Uh, one thing I find a little bit um, uh, interesting or, or possibly uh, alarming is that some of those universities are very definitely amidst competition from outside of Thailand uh, falling back. So if you take a look at, say, um, uh, Tamasat uh, or uh, Kesestart University, you can actually see that they are um, struggling to hold on to their positions and at best they're stable and static. In fact, so are so some of the top ones. In fact, in the QS, um, you'll see that um, there's a slight, um, if you like, fallback in uh, in the top university from 208th in 2021 to 215 um, this year. Okay, next slide, please. I'm gonna go through these quickly because you can have access, you're very welcome to copies of this, which you can get via Applied HE, uh, which may help you with your own analysis later. Uh, again, uh, top universities in Thailand and QSWUR, uh, it gives numbers of students, numbers of faculty, well, the reported numbers, student-faculty ratios. You see there's quite a range there from 27 down to 7 to 1. Uh, international uh, student numbers and their score out of five stars in the QS, overall QS stars uh, score. Next slide, please. 
Okay, uh, here's the methodology. I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with this. QS, you'll see the weightings. That's the key point. Uh, in fact, 50% of the QS um, uh, ranking is made up of reputation. Uh, and that obviously favors those universities that are old, well-established uh, and government funded. Um, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, if you look at the ranks and the overall scores, um, and you can see the changes there uh, in terms of uh, performance, uh, don't look positive for those public universities in Thailand, certainly based on uh, this current year's results, which incidentally is called 2022 for some reason, which I, I don't fully um, understand. Let's go on to the next slide, please. Uh, here's some of the indicator scores, uh, academic reputation, employer reputation, citations per faculty. Um, I, I'm providing these because it will help you when you look outside of Thailand to do some comparisons with, say, Hong Kong or elsewhere um, to see how those performances and scores actually um, measure up. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, um, faculty student ratios, uh, international faculty, international students. The scores for international faculty and to a lesser extent international students are relatively low for Asia and uh, very low when you compare to um, the more, um, shall we say, the traditional areas of the world like US and Europe um, where international student movement uh, has has always been quite high. Okay, next slide, please. Um, for the Asian university rankings for QS, you can actually see the weightings are somewhat different. Um, it gives uh, less, it still gives 50% on reputation, uh, but it reduces faculty student ratio to 10%, replacing that with staff with PhD and papers uh, per faculty and citations per paper. Um, the international is broken down because there are less international faculty and students, the weightings are broken down to 2.5% uh, rather than uh, 5%. And there's the introduction of two other indicators about exchange students, inbound and outbound. Next slide, please. Okay, so, these are the um, AUR ranks and overall scores, and Thailand performs uh, reasonably well, I think, in, in, uh, in terms of its public universities um, in the Asia region. Uh, next slide, please. Again, you'll have time to look through this properly later. You'll see that the indicators for uh, THE are somewhat different, but once again, uh, under teaching and research, you'll see that there is... 33% uh, is allocate, allocated once again to reputation. Now, I can tell you from experience, the trick with um, times higher that many universities, uh, certainly in Hong Kong, have cottoned on to is to try to submit the lowest possible faculty FTE number. Uh, because whilst that might damage the 4.5% weighting allocated to staff student ratio, you actually gain. Uh, on the uh, doctorates awarded to academic staff, um, the institutional income, because that's um, uh, related to uh, how big your university is faculty-wise, um, your uh, research productivity, your proportion of international staff, et cetera, et cetera. All of those indicators are improved by keeping the FTE faculty number low. And many universities around the globe, and Hong Kong is no exception, have recognized that. And you'll see um, how they're quite sophisticated about how they exclude faculty from the very loose definitions that are provided. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, ranks and overall scores. You'll see once again, there's a beginnings of a decline uh, in some of those areas over the past three years. You can look at that in detail later. Next slide, please. 
I'm looking forward to getting to the private universities and then you'll see um, why I think there's a need for a new ranking. Okay, THE indicator scores, um, very clear there. And you can see which universities have cottoned on to the right strategy for submission of data, and which have, have not yet woken up to um, that approach. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, that's just a international outlook and uh, industry income. I always think that the industry income is somewhat unfair uh, because uh, some countries are very cash rich like Hong Kong and uh, other countries uh, don't have um, the GDP to invest so much in its higher education. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is the ARWU. Uh, again, this favors old, well-established, big named universities from around the world. How many alumni have you got that have won Nobel Prizes and Fields Medals, the Nobel Prize in, in maths? Um, you know, how many highly cited researchers have you got or nowadays can you afford? Uh, how many papers have been published in Nature and Science? Um, uh, the next one's a bit more reasonable. Um, uh, so I think you can that demonstrate to you why Thailand doesn't do very well in the ARWU. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay. Um, so uh, these are top universities in Thailand in the ARWU. There are many fewer. Uh, uh, once again, similar names to those names that came up earlier. And once again, I would suggest um, that, that they're fairly static. Um, there's not really any movement at all, apart from Chula Longkorn, um, over the past three years in terms of those universities. So I wonder what the value of that ranking is to those universities, probably very little. Let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, these are some of the indicator scores. Um, and uh, you'll notice that some of the indicator scores show a zero. So once again, the value of ARWU in Thailand, I think, is exceptionally limited at the moment. Let's move on to the next slide. OK, let's look at a stark comparison. I've only got a few more slides left, two or three. Um, what about the privately funded universities from which most of you uh, are drawn? Uh, I think this makes the argument for the need for this private ranking, this university ranking, which deals with private universities in ASEAN. And I really recommend it to you. I was actually on, I chaired the committee um, that set this up. It's something I've wanted to do for the last 10 years because I think private universities get a raw deal. They clearly can't take on some subjects, which are often good for publication because the, the cost of setting them up uh, is just not, um, is not worthwhile and they don't have government money um, or they have little government money compared to public funded universities to put them in place. So next slide, please, Peter. Okay, well, I'm, I'm pleased to show Siam University there. Congratulations. Um, uh, the QSAUR ranks, you'll notice it's the Asian university ranking, not the world ranking. Um, you have Bangkok University, pretty stable, around 400 to 450. You have Siam University, stable, around 401 to 450, actually improved quite a bit uh, over the previous year. And uh, University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce, UTCC, uh, again, making some improvement. And what that tells me is, whilst they're at a disadvantage, these private universities are ambitious. And they're beginning to uh, make some improvements in a system which is not really geared um, to help them. Let's move on to the next slide, please. OK, top private universities in Thailand, the QS AUR indicator scores. Well, no scores for staff with PhD, citations for paper, papers for faculty or international research network. Um, and actually, you'll notice under reputation, there's some dashes there. That's because they don't reach the threshold in terms of reputation. Well, of course they wouldn't. They're private universities. 
they're not um, old established names that are funded by rich governments from around the world. Um, they're actually new kids on the block quite often. Uh, they might be young. Uh, but they're certainly ambitious and they're certainly moving in the right direction when you compare them with their public counterparts. And the next slide, please. OK, so I've tried to give you a whistle stop tour to catch up some of the time we lost earlier. Uh, if you want some further reading um, and for a more detailed look at precisely how rankings have impacted on universities, um, please feel free to get hold of this book. I think um, uh, if you have trouble getting it, I know Applied HE can help you, published by uh, Routledge. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attention. I hope very much that you found this helpful. I hope that you will take part in the new private university rankings for ASEAN because their success depends upon you. Uh, and uh, if you support those rankings, uh, then you will certainly be able to use them to promote your private uh, university. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kevin. Um, let me stop sharing. There we go. And now let me uh, hand over the floor to um, Professor Yutana from Siam University, um, oh, okay. who will chair the panel. Okay, all right, so uh, thank you very much, Peter. Um, welcome to the panel discussion on the impact of higher education ranking systems on universities. Uh, my name is Yutana, uh, the Deputy Dean of Law School at Siam University. Uh, it's my honor to moderate this session with uh, four distinguished uh, panelists. So please allow me to introduce um, each of our distinguished guests uh, in this panel. Uh, first, um, we just listened to his presentation. Uh, he is the Secretary to Council and Court Director of the uh, Institutional Research Office, City University of Hong Kong. Please welcome um, Dr. Kevin Dunn. Um, next, uh, he is the Vice President of Sam University, that's my place, uh, Vice President of Digital Council of Thailand and IT Committee Chair of Association of Private Higher Education Institutions of Thailand. Uh, please welcome Professor Dr. Vishen Prem Chai Um Next, uh, he is the president of National Association of Private Educational Institutions of Malaysia. Uh, please welcome Professor Elasalan Mohan. And our last panelist, um, she is the assistant to the president for special affairs and international relations at Kim Mongkut University of Technology, North Bangkok in Thailand. Uh, please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Malini C. Aryanan. Okay, thank you very much for your time. So let's get started. Um, let's start with uh, Dr. Downing. Uh, actually, we just listened to you to your presentation, but would you please give us an, a short introduction about the ranking system in Hong Kong special? It'll be very short because you've already heard enough from me, but one of the things I would say is that Hong Kong um, is a very, is a very uh, mature and sophisticated higher education market. And in that way, um, the majority of our universities here are publicly funded. We have a, a couple that are not. Uh, one is funded by Hang Seng Bank, and the other is a University of Wollongong spin-off from my mm. own university. It was our community college. In fact, I handled the spin-off on behalf of the university. Um, so there are now two private universities, uh, large, there are others, but there are two large private universities uh, in Hong Kong. Um, and they're not really comparable because their funding is uh, substantially better um, than would be the case in many other Asian and indeed European private university systems. Thank you. Nice. All right. Thank you very much. So um, next, Dr. Wixian, uh, would you please... Um, share us about the ranking system on private universities in Thailand. Would you please give us a short introduction about it, please? You're muted. Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for, for uh, uh, inviting me to coming to the, the uh, event. First, uh, I think that uh, you need to know that in uh, Thailand, all universities in Thailand, 
both public and private, are classified as the non-profit organization. When we uh, talk about the uh, university ranking, maybe uh, in private university in uh, any country, maybe it's uh, different for uh, uh, profit and non-profit. It's also di different. And as I know, as he said, uh, Dr. Kevin already uh, told everyone that uh, the uh, ranking in Thailand, uh, private university participate in uh, really uh, only a few uh, university. For example, in UI ranking in last year, there are only three university in the ranking namely Turakit Bandit University, Hanyai University, and Siam University. And also in the uh, QS University ranking, uh, Dr. Kevin uh, just uh, presented, it's also only three universities. Uh, Bangkok University, University of Thai Chamber of Commerce, and Siam University. Uh, from this data, we can see that uh, private university in Thailand may, look, uh, may not quite uh, active in the uh, university ranking. Uh, that is the situation of private university in Thailand. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think now we can see some key differences between uh, Hong Kong and, and, and Thailand. So um, next, that would be uh, Professor Mohan. Uh, would you please share us about the ranking system in Malaysia? Yeah, thank you, moderator. Yeah, I think first, I think I'll give you an overview of the Malaysian uh, higher education uh, scenario here. So we have 20 public universities who are publicly funded, but we have about 435 private universities and colleges. Yeah, and uh, we don't get any funding from the government we all self-funded, yeah, that's how it goes. And the, the contribution of the private education sector towards the GDP of the country is over 40 billion ringgit, yeah. However, we don't have a, a ranking system, but we have a rating system. Okay. It was long ago shut down because of you are publicly funded, we are privately funded, so you can't do the, the rating, yeah. So. Sorry, I can't do the ranking. So we have a rating system and we have two types of ratings. One uh, is for the universities, another rating system for the uh, colleges. And even in the uh, universities rating, we have three uh, classifications. One that is a matured university, which are more than 15 years uh, in operation. And we have which are emerging universities. And the third category is for university colleges, yeah? Then the other category is, and, and these uh, ratings are uh, not by numbers, but they are more by uh, star rating. You got best is six stars, five stars, uh, four stars, three stars, and one normally they don't give any star because that means <laughs> you are not uh, to be rated, yeah? So uh, this is the rating system. And for colleges, similarly, they have another rating system. Um, and the private sector is one of the biggest, as I mentioned, is biggest contributors towards the uh, education in the country. More than 50% of the uh, tertiary education is done by the private education sector. But, and all, I mean, in spite of contributing to the economy of the country, we get zero. Yeah, no funding at all. So we have to look for our own funds. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mohan. I think this is very interesting that there's only the rating system in Malaysia, right? Okay. So uh, let's come back to Thailand for just a moment. Uh, we just learned from uh, Dr. Vishian that um, there are a few private universities in Thailand uh, rank it, I have a ranking about, about it. But there will be a lot about um, public universities in, in Thailand uh, for the ranking. So. Um, Dr. Malini, would you please give us an introduction about the public universities ranking in Thailand? Okay, uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Yitana, for inviting me. Uh, let me share some slides. Okay, please. Mm. 
it's coming. Okay. Okay. So, uh, as a um, uh, public university in Thailand, um, right now we are supported by our government. Uh, the uh, ministry that we are uh, responsible for this is the uh, Ministry of uh, Higher Education, Science, Research, and Innovation, or we call Mahesi in short. Uh, so um, actually, my, myself, I have been taken in charge of the ranking university of my uh, workplace uh, about four years ago. And the first time that I come in into this role, I have been in a workshop on the QS and Mahesi uh, minister. Uh, that's why we are really need to do the, the world ranking because we really want to attract uh, our uh, student applicants and uh, our staff and the society to uh, be in our university. And of course, we are the public university. We are funded uh, majorly by our government. So uh, that's why in public Thai university right now, we are really into the participation of uh, the world ranking. Uh, as the professor Darling sir has uh, mentioned about the uh, criteria of the QS and GSP rankings, uh, that's uh, the major score is focused on the, the reputation surveys and the publication in the um, Scopus or the web of site database, something like that. Uh, in Thailand, because uh, as um, uh, Dr. Manit, as the first speakers, I uh, have mentioned that in every university in the world, we have different uh, mission and goals. So that's why uh, Thai University also joined in the QA star rating as Professor Mohanser uh, talking about. Uh, because the QA star and PhD impact ranking or even the UI green metrics, these three uh, ranking uh, institutes, they are focused differently. For example, they focus on um, the development of SDG goal, the sustainable development goal uh, that will be uh, impact to not only the academic point of view, but also uh, the quality of life of the student and the uh, communities. And we also have another um, different type of uh, the ranking. Uh, let's say you multi rank, uh, that will be more focused on the um, graduation and the uh, work uh, hiring, hiring or employer things. Uh, that uh, will be the, the major score of you multi ranks and something else. But then uh, after we participate in many, many of ranking, then the question is coming up like, what is the attractive point of the thing that forced public university to join in the ranking system? It is uh, as the public point of view, a public university point of view that we get the budget allocation from our Thai government, especially from uh, Mahesi Minister. Uh, so there is uh, some statistics to show uh, that I take it from our uh, higher education uh, communities uh, that we have a different uh, budget allocation in uh, Thailand during 2019. And as you can see that the, the top brand you know, see in Thailand we got more portion of uh, the budget. Uh, this is the unit of million baht. And then uh, for right now, uh, not only talking about the incentive that government give us the money, but also I think it's a good way that uh, our government gives us the guideline to direct our uh, excellency and expertise in each university. We call uh, reinventing university that uh, Dr. Pantum Saxer has been mentioned in the speaker uh, organization. Uh, that uh, Thai, public Thai university and I think private university too have been divided for four classes for main mission, which are uh, including the global and foreign research, uh, technology and innovation and professional development and area based and communities. So right now uh, in public, Thai public university have to be uh, selected and have to uh, like drive ourselves to a main goal uh, to be uh, like get a very good achievement in 
in uh, expertise in each area of this, and then uh, the government will uh, allocate the budget to support <coughs> and get the better position for each mission like this. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I think we can see the whole, the big picture in each country. Uh, they are different. Okay, uh, they adopt different um, systems in each country. So let's talk about the impact of the ranking systems to um, students and also other stakeholders. So let's get back to Dr. Downing again uh, to hear uh, this from him. I actually just share the good, the bad, and the ugly things about the ranking systems, right? So, so in summary, what's your opinion about this? Um, I, I, I really don't have very much to add to what I already presented in terms of good, bad, and ugly. Um, I do think that uh, private universities are significantly disadvantaged. That's, that's a really bad uh, thing. And I do think even those public universities that have a local or community-based mission, um, they don't really fit with the indicators for any of the world university rankings. Uh, they're, they're busy preparing people for jobs. Um, Andy already mentioned job-ready um, ratings. They're busy preparing people for jobs rather than, um, you know, uh, getting students to publish high level papers in Scopus listed uh, journals. So uh, really, uh, I'll, I'll leave my comments at that, I think. Um, thank okay. you very much, Rutana. I get it. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Dr. Vishian, would you please uh, share your opinion or concern about the ranking systems in general? Yeah, okay, thank you. I think the uh, university ranking in the, uh, in general, I think we try to uh, intend to help the prospective student to choose the uh, top university. Mm. Yeah, and uh, also I think that uh, it's not uh, certainly uh, perfect. And uh, popular university ranking are uh, the I think it's a good way for students to, to find out in the uh, ranking system. And the uh, good thing is that I think it should, it can be the platform for university to mon monitor their work because, uh, because of the ranking. So they can know uh, they can work well in each area or, or not. And second, secondly, I think it's uh, also the platform for students to uh, choose university, to choose the optimum university that uh, should be uh, suit, suit for them. And also for university, uh, I think that uh, you can compete with the, uh, the similar or cross university in, in the, the ranking and also uh, can as the uh, partnership of university that uh, have the common in interest and also uh, support decision for the policy because uh, we know the performance of uh, uh, our university so we, we can uh, get a plan for, for that. And also if we uh, would like to go to some specific area uh, maybe uh, the uh, ranking also can help us to choose the area that may be good for for university and also uh, uh, disadvantage one. Uh, for disadvantage, as well, all we know that uh, uh, it's hard to find the standard for the ranking, and uh, it carry relative the. Uh, what we call chaos, like uh, University A can have their very good ranking in one ranking system, but on the uh, another uh, ranking system, it, uh, but the uh, ranking is not, not, not a good one. So uh, people may be very confusing about that. And also for some institution, maybe if they focus, uh, uh, focus on the ranking, maybe uh, it make them to uh, forgot to uh, do the, the the writing or the main thing of university because they try to uh, push uh, the uh, the score in the ranking only. So it's not uh, 
maybe uh, live it, the, the real one. And also, uh, as I mentioned in the, the, uh, the first step, the, the, they still have the permanent and continuous uh, criticism about the subject of uh, ranking. Okay, that, that all that I, I think that's uh, the pro and con of the uh, university ranking. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. It seems like um, nothing is perfect, right? So uh, we, we, it's a simple clue, but, but actually maybe it's too simple. If we miss something, then we miss something for, for good because ranking does, doesn't represent everything. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, Professor Mohan, is there any pros and cons in your opinion about the ranking system? Professor Mohan? Yes, uh, would you please uh, unmute it? Yes. yes. Now, as overall, first you must know what is the purpose of ranking, yeah? What are we trying to achieve? Now, if you are in the top 10 or top 20, yes, people will look at you. If you are 100, you are 200, and just now like what uh, Kevin shared, some are 300 and 400, so what are you trying to prove? So do I go to number 300 or 301? Or do I, go, do I go to 299? <laughs> so I don't think you make such uh, decisions based on those uh, rankings, yeah? And um, the good points may be, I mean, it'll uh, always keep you on your toes so that you want, it's a motivation for you to do well. But end of the day, as we're talking about private universities, for us, is student numbers. And where do the students' uh, numbers come from? If you are 300 or 400, People don't look at that, yeah? People look at Oxford, people look at Cambridge, yes. And moreover, the sum of the programs are niche programs, you know? So if a particular university can be uh, in the top 10, but the program I want is not there. So where do I go? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, even in the Malaysian rating, uh, one of the universities not ranking is the, the rating, they got a six star rating. But recently, I don't know whether you have seen in the papers, some students, uh, international students, have uh, sued the university for uh, because the programs are not accredited. So what are we trying to show? What is the instrument that is being used? So if they have got a six-star rating, then everything must be in order. So why did this happen? So what is the instrument we are using? And, uh, and, in, and in another case, uh, also on a rating basis. So uh, a particular university got a rating of six as well. But the next day you see in the uh, the Facebook I'm, and they're putting all sorts of jokes there. I don't know how my university got the uh, rating of six when I don't see lecturers in my class <laughs> and the lecturers have not covered my syllabus. You get it or not? So at end of the day, the student, he has got his needs. So what is he looking for? And in fact, students, they are your uh, what do you call ambassadors. They will recommend whether you can go to this university, they like the way it's teaching, they don't care whether you are global rating. And the next thing is the employability. See how employable are my, uh, my, my seniors and how are the industry looking at them? So these are the, the main key factors, see? And for private universities and all that, for us is funding. Yeah, if there's no funding, then it's very difficult to get into the uh, ranking system because we know it is not cheap to go into the ranking system. As what earlier was mentioned, that the amount you have to pay to agents to come and look into your work and get you ready for all this, I think is not worth it. So even you spend so much of money, so where are you going to get back the money? So you have to transfer the cost to your students because we are privately funded. So although there may be some good points, the pros, but I think the cons are uh, more than the, uh, the pros. This is my view. Thank you. Okay, interesting. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, at the end, we look at uh, students' competency, something like that. Yes. Okay, all right, uh, Dr. Malini. Uh, what do you think about the ranking systems in your opinion, please? Sure, um, let me share a little bit of my slides. Oh, sure. Um, okay. Okay, uh, it's good. 
Okay. Uh, let me talk about the, the pros from, from my uh, experience about the ranking first. Uh, for the pros, uh, when I jump into this uh, role in my university, what I found and also my colleagues that working in the ranking, uh, we found out that the ranking is a good platform that we can uh, it can help us to really monitor what the activity that we have done in our university. You know, like university, especially public university in Thailand, we are quite big number, like many of people in our university. Let's say in my university, we have students about 27,000 and the staff, we have about uh, 35, 35, uh, 3,500 people. So probably about 30,000 people in the university. We actually have many activities, but we never know like we are working on which activities. And then the, the um, difference of the ranking system helps us to really monitor and really observe what we are really doing in our university. And then after we know that what we did, then we can help uh, to make the uh, policy to drive our university to the direction. For example, you know, like several years uh, recently, uh, there are different of the new project, especially on the research program and academic program that uh, in previously our university never thinking about to, to build up this project before. For example, like uh, the research, the intensive research program about the uh, satellite and the railway system. This, this is this project, we never think about that before, but after we have an intensive uh, direction uh, to uh, take the big giant step uh, in our university. So that's why we decide let's go for it and we work for it. Yeah, so I think it's good for, for making a very critical policy to put the effort, put the people and put the money into that project. What about uh, the cons thing? I would say uh, it's really distracting the student in my opinion sometimes uh, because student is also have a like biodiversity, right? Um, so let's think about like if some student they they really uh, grew up in the local community and maybe in their mind they're thinking about I want to to live nearby my my hometown. I want to uh, like study in the nearby my the college like nearby my house and after I graduate I want to work in the same area that I grew up. But then the point is like when ranking system coming in then the university in that like hometown maybe is University of Nowhere and maybe they cannot get a job after graduate from that university because maybe the industry and the employer uh, also maybe they interest to hire the student who graduate from the top 10 university. And in that case, I think uh, that may be confusing the student. Like, should I attend my local university and come back to develop my hometown or should I go to a big, big university that in the metropolitan or in the big city that far, far away from my hometown? So uh, also not talking about the, the localization of the student uh, based on the, um, the ranking result of university, but also the, uh, the, the career, the type of career that student we should, uh, like let's say maybe I, if I uh, a little student, then I think like, should I go with the uh, subject area that have the top rank, then I can get higher chance to get a job or should I go to the subject and get, get a career with the uh, low rank or low rank um, subject, but it's the career that I, uh, a career of my dreams, something like that. Uh, so that's why uh, sometimes, even it's a good for, for driving the university, but also maybe uh, it's like uh, have some uh, distracting uh, moment for the, the uh, potential student to the university. Yeah, thank you. Okay, all right. Interesting and wow, time flies. Uh, we have reached the final round of this uh, panel discussion. So um, uh, for the final round, uh, may I please ask uh, our panelists to share 
Um, your thoughts about the future of the ranking systems? Uh, start with uh, Dr. Downing, please. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it's a very good question. Uh, my view is that they'll they've proliferated considerably since 2003 when um, uh, they Shanghai Jiao Tong kicked off. 2004 when what was then Times Higher QS um, kicked off. I, I actually think that you'll see more proliferation. You'll see uh, systems like the one that Applied HE is introducing. Um, and universities will choose the system that suits their uh, purposes best and suits the indicators um, best. I mean, for example, uh, Prof Mohan earlier on was mentioning Malaysia. I sat on the um, governing board for MMU, a multimedia university in, in Malaysia for many years, uh, and also did some work with the Ministry of Malaysia. And... Um, uh, rating systems are definitely um, more popular in some areas, and with the with the sort of expansion of rating systems um, from governments and uh, specific rankings like the offering coming from Applied HE for private universities, I think you'll see more focus on choice for universities and the. World university rankings will still have their place, but they'll become less important. I give you, I'll give you an example. The recent THE WUR um, rankings in Hong Kong received about four sentences in the press. Uh, it used to be front page news, um, but four sentences. So I think you know times are changing, um, and rankings will become more diverse and more specific. Interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Vishian, what do you think about it? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, because there are so many uh, details of the uh, ranking system and uh, each system, uh, I think, is uh, not, not the same. And all of them also have both uh, pro and con in university ranking. Therefore, I think that uh, uh, all stakeholders uh, need to uh, okay uh, un understand the criteria and of the ranking system and also uh, carefully select the one that uh, more, more that suitable for them i think that, that that's all okay thank you very much uh professor mohan please you give me a yeah okay yeah, I think uh, like even even in Malaysia, even in the uh, the rating system, as an association, we had also objected to the uh, ministry in the way that, I mean, as a ministry, you are a regulator. As a regulator, you put all the regulations and you are rating it. I think it would not be fair. If at all, it has to be an independent body. Yeah. On a second point, you must look at the stakeholders. Who are our stakeholders? The students. Yeah. So how can the ranking or rating benefit the students? Second, the employers, they are looking for employable graduates. So does the instrument, whatever instruments you're using, does it uh, serve the purpose? Now you can have whatever laboratories, you can have everything. But as far as a student, I've come for a certain purpose, does it meet my purpose? Yeah. So, and, and moreover, the, the, the rating uh, or the, the ranking problems will be this year, you may be ranked high. So based on that, students may come and enroll in your university. But two years down the line, before you graduate, your ranking may go down. So what message have you conveyed to the student? So when I joined, it was ranked higher. But when I graduated, by the time I'm graduating, the ranking has gone down. So will it mean that the standard has gone down? Because some of the standards are different, could be at the managerial level. Because when you look at it, you're looking at the whole establishment. But end of the day is the teaching and learning and the experience and the skills the students leave. So these are the instruments that the instruments should capture so that it reflects the actual learning and teaching and the employability of a great, of a, of a, of a student. And I think greater focus 
might be must be given to these areas. I mean, if uh, applied EG is doing it, I think you should focus more on this. So end of the day is the stakeholders. The parents are very happy, the employer is very happy. So you can be a very top uh, ranking, but then the employee says, no, I don't like. See, I mean, I, I've hired some graduates, but and, and they can't, uh, I mean, uh, are not employable. So again, it goes back to zero. Yeah, so this is my uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, um, Dr. Malini, please. Okay, um, so I think uh, the, the future direction of the um, university ranking uh, is that we should, I mean, the university should um, participate in a variety of the different ranking. Because uh, as you know, like in every uh, ranking system, we have different criteria and different pros and cons of each uh, ranking system. Uh, so I think uh, it's not a good idea that we put every university for the whole world put in the same basket and ranking, but we should have different basket like uh, THEQS Academy focus on um, reputation survey and the publication. But in case of QS star and the THC impact, focus on more the SDG things. So this means if uh, different university have different mission, then uh, we can be number one in any land. The point is uh, the thing that we really need to do as a whole world and like a collaboration is to uh, deliver the message of each ranking. Uh, let's say if I said, okay, ranking by a uh, company A, uh, this one is focused on developing the lifelong learning. And then university of uh, like university B is the number one. Then we can probably say that this university has the clear mission to develop the lifelong learning goals. And in some university, like, like let's say my university, we are uh, number one in mathematics in Thailand. And then we can probably say that we are number one in this specific field, uh, but we have to be clearly and deliver the message to the stakeholder, to the student, to the parents, to the industry that our university has a clear mission in a specific way. So I think this one could be a more fair game to the university and the stakeholder and the audience of the university ranking. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a wonderful and fruitful panel discussion. Uh, once again, um, our distinguished guests, uh, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts about the ranking systems. I think we learned a lot about, uh, about the ranking systems, about your opinions in, from this session. And thanks for watching this session. Back to you, Peter. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I will now talk a little bit about the Applied HG ranking and rating system. Um, and um, actually quite a lot of points that the panelists made we, we, while we were developing this because we've been yeah talking to a lot of stakeholders. So this is a very quick introduction. Um, yeah, the, when you develop a rating or ranking, the first question you ask yourself is what makes a good university? And that is of course a completely subjective question because it depends on who you ask. Now, what does a student think about? They might think about lifelong learning as was just mentioned or uh, sustainability and community or how international it is or whether you can study in English, um, knowledge and skills they get, whether they can get a job or create a job, it really depends. Um, but as, a, as the decision makers at the table at an institution, Essentially, you want to look at the evaluation tools that fit with your values. Uh, and, and I think that was just mentioned by uh, uh, Prof. Malini as well. Uh, like, what are you, is your goal? Then, then what is the evaluation tool that fits that? Um, so I'll quickly dive into that. Um, so Applied HE, we've got the, the Rankometer ranking, which was essentially a remixing of five different world university rankings, which for us was a kind of pilot to make some noise and now the more serious um, private university ranking ASEAN. Um, and I want to especially talk about that one because currently our, our promotion for that is ongoing and uh, you can register until October 15th. And most of you um, from private university should have received all our documentation for that. Now, the Applied HE um, ranking system, if you will, uh, we're just starting with the first ranking. 
um, is that we look at six core criteria. Uh, and this is roughly in order of importance. So first and foremost, the quality of teaching and learning. Then comes employability, where the graduates get jobs. Uh, third is research. Fourth, community outreach, internationalization, and then institutional reputation. Now, depending on the country, or the type of university that we're evaluating, public versus private, we would change the weighting of these criteria and possibly add one or two additional criteria that are particularly relevant and for which reliable data is available. Now, the main sources of ranking data that we use is a student survey, which is done online, and it's fully uh, GDPR or PDP compliant, um, that we try and distribute to at least 10% of students. So every university that participates in the ranking has to run a student survey, because this is how we find out what it's really about, what the core stakeholders and students really think. The second indicator uh, is uh, bibliometrics is from Google Scholar. Now, very conscious decision to use Google Scholar because it's a much bigger, broader database that catches way more academic papers um, and therefore probably much more suitable for catching the research that private universities in ASEAN are doing, which isn't necessarily the most highbrow new to the world research, but which is still extremely relevant to the local community. Um, and then the third one is uh, institutional data, where we do uh, verified interval sampling audit. Uh, so basically a number of universities, we will go back to them, say thank you for submitting data, now prove it. Um, and we'll be the first ranking agency to do this. Um, so why should you join uh, the private university ranking ASEAN from Applied HE? Uh, well, first of all, because we think the, the, relevant, the criteria and the weightings are more relevant, especially to private universities. So that's, that's the obvious argument. Uh, if you say that um, we're not properly represented in a, in a research-heavy ranking, then um, kind of walk the talk and, and join an alternative ranking so that you get what you want, uh, which, which is our ranking. Um, second, uh, it offers peer benchmarking. It's an opportunity to see where you stand um, with local peers within the ASEAN region. Probably most interesting for you will be where you stand in your own country or city. Um, often the saying goes, if you rank, you exist. So especially for universities that are not currently in any of the big rankings, this is an opportunity. And finally, there's no charge. Uh, so a point was made that rankings is expensive. That may be true in some instances, but not in this case. There is no charge for uh, the Applied HE Private University Ranking ASEAN. Everybody can join free of charge. Um, then briefly about the ratings. So we have three rating systems. Um, the job ready rating is kind of 306 degree, 360 degree learning and employability where we do student alumni and faculty surveys, which are basically the main stakeholders. Then we also have an English ready rating and an online ready rating, um, which cover um, those specific areas of teaching, whether you teach well in English um, and whether um, your online program is of a high standard. And there we use a student and faculty online surveys. So we've got a number of newly rated institutions. Um, then talking specifically about the job ready rating, um, we think it, it kind of um, uh, proves itself in three particular areas. First of all, it's highly relevant um, because it focuses on careers, on learning, on um, community, and on industry collaboration. It's also highly versatile um, because it can be applied all the way from a vocational degree to a postgraduate degree. And finally, it's interdisciplinary because we have these 22 employment clusters that Mandy already mentioned. So these are very quickly some of the rating criteria. And um, once you start to dive into these criteria, you realize that they also fit very well with some of the sustainable development goals like quality education, decent work and economic growth, reduced inequalities, um, peace and justice, uh, industry innovation, infrastructure, all these factors quickly come in if you want to have a kind of broader community stakeholder-based rating process. And um, so while we didn't set out to do an SDG type of rating, um, our criteria can very easily be used to evaluate your institution's performance in the SDGs. 
in a much more comprehensive way than perhaps a ranking would. Now we get data from the student survey, faculty survey and alumni and employer surveys. And we also have some institutional data, which we ask you to submit. Um, the point here to make is perhaps to, to talk about the similarity and differences between rankings and ratings. A ranking necessarily is always an indicator of your global standing relative to other institutions. Um, but that may have very little bearing on what your local contribution is uh, to stakeholders and what their perception is of your institution. Um, so perhaps if you're in a perhaps slightly more deprived region, less research funding available, your global standing within the ASEAN private university ranking may not be as high as, as you'd like, but you could still be rated extremely high because local employers, local students, faculty, etc., see that what you're doing is extremely relevant. Um, so this is some of the similarities and differences. The quick takeaway here is that the rating is a much more thorough, in-depth kind of rating and evaluation tool than the ranking, uh, where yes, with the ranking, we try to hit all the, the major boxes, but by its very nature, we can't go in-depth for everything. Um, our English ready rating, I think, particular in Thailand, if universities are running English language programs, is very relevant. So if you're a university that's internationalizing, not many students are going to learn fluent Thai and enter your institutions. But many students may already be fluent in English, may wish to learn some Thai, may wish to learn about your country, um, but they just might be a little bit uncertain about studying in English in Thailand because there's such a diversity of meaning what an English taught program is. Sometimes the books are in English, the slides are in English, but then the exams are still in the local language. The teaching is still in the local language. And this kind of rating is a way that we can show to your students and stakeholders, also internally, that you really deliver uh, English throughout the program and of a very high standard. Um, the online ready rating, again, is a similar story. It's very hard to have a benchmark of what quality online teaching is. Um, I can email you the syllabus and I can say, come back in three months and do the exam. Or we can have these kind of online webinars, uh, discussions in depth. Um, and so this is an opportunity to benchmark your online programs against the global standard. Um, also to target uh, students that might not otherwise pursue an online degree with you. Um, and also to understand uh, student and faculty perspectives. Now, it's important to note that our rating processes are very streamlined, uh, so quick results are possible. Uh, typically, it takes about two weeks for you to do the institutional data submission. That's up to your institution. Then we have a survey period of about four weeks. Um, can be longer if you need more time. Um, we can then immediately produce a preliminary report for you while we do the data audit. Once the data audit is done, you have one month to decide if you want to publish. So throughout with our rating process, you can always um, pull the plug or say, stop, don't want to go further right now. Um, and then we don't publish your rating results. That's always a choice. Um, yeah, all these um, surveys, all these ratings are actively being done. So these are the, the demo surveys that you can check out. So you get an impression of how our system works. Um, generally speaking, this, this system of sending out links, usually via social media, and then having responses come in, uh, often people responding on their phone works very well. We're very satisfied with that. Now, another point I'd like to point out is that our ratings and also our rankings are just the beginning, right? It's the beginning of a bigger process. We don't just want to give you a scorecard or a report card, and then everybody goes home. Um, the first uh, part is about the saying that data is the new goal. Right, So we give you very, very detailed reporting um, about uh, basically the performance that your institution has in specific indicators, how you benchmark against your peer group, what the stakeholder perception is, and we can also provide you with anonymized raw data so that you can do your own analysis. So we basically give you the full value of what we've collected. Um, also, if you do the ranking, by the way. Um, you also get all these promotional materials, so the, the badge, the, the rating certificate, uh, a confidential rating report, which you can publish if you want to, uh, but you can also keep it uh, close to yourself. Um, plenty of publicity on appliedhe.com and also 
press release, of course, uh, via Google News, since we're indexed by them. Um, yeah, and basically, I'll leave it here, uh, if the interest of time. If you have any questions, please write to us. And of course, if you're a private university <coughs> in ASEAN, please write to us as well if you haven't been contacted by Applied HE yet, because now is the time to, um, to register for that. I see a quick question. Is there, uh, do we need minimum uh, number of survey responses? Yes, you do. We're aiming for a student response rate of about 10% uh, with an absolute minimum of 5%. So if you get lower responses, you get a little bit of points reduced. Now, if you have done or are doing the job ready rating, um, the survey questions overlap, they integrate 100%. So if you were thinking of doing the job ready rating as a private university in ASEAN, now is the time to do it. Number one, you get a, a big discount on doing it. And number two, you only have to run the surveys once, uh, which saves you a lot of time. So thank you very much for that question. And again, if there's any other questions, please write to us uh, at this address. Um, I think that's it. Um, we're still uh, more or less within time. I'd now like to hand over for the closing remarks to Dr. Ponchai Monkon Vanit, the president of Siam University. Uh, go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very much delighted to be in this session because I have learned a lot about the size of ranking and rating. And I also like to say that, like, I, I have met uh, Mandy, I think that it's over 20 years when she started uh, doing uh, the QS. And what I can say is that it's much beyond expectation. And for today, I also have learned about Apply HE. At first, I think that it's only one Apply HE, but uh, I'm also very much impressed that uh, you have many products that uh, the university also can benefit from. I think that uh, you are right, uh, right to the target uh, of many universities like mine, because I think that uh, we also have to transform ourselves. We also have to focus more on like language competency, focus more on employability. And I think that this is also more or less uh, give us uh, the answer to what we need. And I think that uh, for me, I think that uh, ranking is like a mirror. It also depends, one, one side is depend on the quality of the mirror. The other side is also depends on the angle that you look at the mirror. But I, th I believe that the more mirror we have, uh, the more choice uh, we also can do. And I think that uh, when I have a chance to listen uh, to the expert, I think that uh, Mandy, I think that you are not only the founder, but you also founder and former CEO and also very energetic uh, people in the world ranking uh, system. I also have heard about uh, ranking size from Kevin Downing. I think this is also uh, very, very influential and very, beneficial to me. You know everything about Thailand. You know everything about private and public university. I think that uh, in that case, I think that we should form the alliance to work together with uh, our association. Uh, I mean, association of public uh, university, no, not public, private university of Thailand that I happen to be uh, the president uh, during this time. And I, I, hope, I, I also hope that in the future, we also can work uh, together between public, private university and also uh, other stakeholders like the, the industry. And as you have seen that uh, right now, uh, you, it is not that only you have the new system. Thailand also have the new and energetic uh, ministry that is responsible for higher education as well. We also are ready to uh, work with you and work with anyone who can improve the quality of education to be more relevant. When I have uh, heard uh, from many speakers today, I think that uh, what we are talking is essentially about the future. And I also think that in the near future, I expect that the area of higher education will be expand and overlap. This means that uh, 
probably uh, our area and area of uh, Professor Mohan and, and also other country will be overlapped to each other. And I think that it, this is also the opportunity that we can work with each other to foster uh, the quality of the manpower in the future as well. So what I like to say is that I, on behalf of Siam University that has been appointed to be the host of this event, I also like to thank uh, every uh, speaker, every uh, influential speaker that we have today. I'd like to uh, start with Dr. Mandy Mock, I, and also Kevin, and also uh, Dr. Malini, and Dr. Vichian, Dr. Yutana, and the most important thing is uh, my, uh, my helper at the association, Dr. Malit. So, this is what I like to say, and also Dr. Pam Thurm Sat, that we made, I hope that he will make the speech uh, uh, after this, because we are also in the other screen of uh, the reinventing committee. So uh, I also like to say that I'd like to thank uh, to all of you and looking forward to work, work closely with all of you in the near future. Thank you very much from uh, Siam University and also from the Association of Private University in Thailand. Thank you very much, Swadi Club. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Punjai. Uh, now the floor is open to Mr. Kumpran Sak uh, Aruni, the Senior HRD Specialist uh, from the Ministry of Higher Education, Science, Research and Innovation, Thailand. Hi, good evening, uh, dear executive of the Applied Higher Education at Siam University. It has been a very informative and educational discuss over the conference today. I am very pleased to highlight that the output of the discussion has certainly created a better understanding of, of, of our impact on higher education ranking system on university, especially the private university. Also, I would like to ins insist that the conference has been well implemented to meet the needs of the beneficial to every participant, both the online and on-site. It had gained a lot of momentum for the university to move forward into, in order to prepare themselves for the new world. In closing, I would like to express my appreciation again to both FIHP and Siam University for the effort and, and contribution. My special thanks go to all distinguished speakers and panelists for making the event better, more being more informative and educational. Last but not least, may I declare the closing of the conference and I wish we can meet again in the person after the COVID pandemic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then the final words to Ms. Mandy Mock, the founder and CEO of Planet uh, Mandy, you're muted. How could I do that? <laughs> My apologies. Thank you everyone for your time today. I hope you've enjoyed the presentations and panel discussions and find the information useful. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our host, Siam University. Thank you, Dr. Ponchai, for graciously hosting Applied AG launch in Thailand. Um, special thanks also to Ms. Ying Sohani, Deputy Director for International Affairs, and her awesome team who have worked very hard behind the scene to make this webinar possible. Big thanks also to all our speakers and panelists for the very insightful sharing and thought provoking knowledge. And all of this is possible because of you, the audience. Thank you for taking the time to join us today from Thailand and beyond. Although this marks the end of this webinar, I hope to see all of you soon online, of course, at our next webinar, Fireside Chat, with the theme, what does the post-pandemic new normal look like in higher education on the 6th of October, 8 p.m. Singapore time?